Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV. I'm here in Bend, Oregon with uh, Mr. Jeff Briggs. Uh, Jeff and I were roommates some time ago, now about 30 years ago in Chicago. That's right. At the Brass House in Evanston, Illinois, where we were students at Northwestern. Um, Jeff is uh, currently uh, in Bend, Oregon. Beautiful family. Thank it's you. great to see them tonight. Yeah. And uh, he's uh, in the financial industry here in Bend and also principal trumpet of the Central Oregon Symphony. And before you moved to Bend, you were uh, co-principal trumpet with Lake Forest and some other other area orchestras in Chicago. Played a, never got to play a concert with Lake Forest that I can remember, but I uh, uh, had won an audition to be co-principal trumpet in Lake Forest in uh, 88 and then moved in 88 to shoot, uh, from Chicago to Bend. And then prior to that, played in... Some of the community groups, um, Waukegan Symphony and the Classical Symphony that met down in the Fine Arts Building, um, lots of small groups and some subbing, mm -hmm. try to get experience. That's great. Now, um, you studied with uh, Mr. Chickowitz at Northwestern, and also you studied some with Mr. Jacobs. Can you describe to me um, uh, your, your initial contact with Mr. Chickowitz? Uh, was that at Northwestern? Chickowitz was uh, was able to attend grad school. Um, it's a one-year program in Northwestern at the time, so that was uh, 1983 to 1984, and that's the year I lived in the, the Brass House with you and several other people that... Uh, brass players. Yes. All brass right. players. That's right. All the time. And um, so I had auditioned, and then... Um, I made a phone call, hadn't heard anything, and made a phone call and talked to Mr. Chickowitz and, and um, expressed my anxiousness about getting into school. And, and uh, he then said, okay, uh, you're in. And that was the start of uh, quite a bit of change in my own playing. I had been at Cincinnati for four years prior to that, but had experienced uh, a couple of embouchure changes and really differences in, in uh, playing that... Uh, were pretty traumatic to my playing. So after four years of that, finally going to where I wanted to go at, at Northwestern, um, it was the start of, of really learning how to play in a way that I think was much more efficient and much more musical. So Mr. Chickowitz got to you to, um, he was able to, to get you through those problems right. initially at a, at a basic level. Correct. To uh, be able to produce sounds and, and uh, have some function on the instrument. And then with Mr. Jacobs, um, there was... Somehow there was more of the same, but you were telling me that there was also an attention to uh, just the musical motivation. I found that having Mr. Chickowitz instruct me on in how to correctly play the trumpet was what I needed immediately. And, um, and that got going in the right direction. And then it was a matter of, I felt like being behind in um, maybe at, at the level that I wanted to be at based on the age that I was. But it was when I got to Mr. Jacobs as a teacher over those next five years um, where he was able to help take, train my thoughts on how to more properly play. Um, they, were, they were a lot of basic uh, items that, that most students of Jacobs would have heard about, the song and the wind and the breathing, but those were just fundamental to, to, to what I even do today. Uh, we have challenging concerts that we play here or the teaching that I do here. Those concept of, of getting out of the way of the song in the wind and really making your instrument be a mirror of what your thoughts are and rather than trying to control your body you, you're controlling your thoughts and you're you're telling a story with the music so when you control your thoughts and that that really goes to control your body it does because it takes your your body from the uh, control aspect out of the picture and you're simply trying to tell a story so the best compliment that I can get is someone who who says to me well, I really felt like you were you were telling a story, or you were really singing that song. Perhaps it was just the lyrical part of a song, but someone could hear, you know, properly done, you know, that compliment of I could really hear you singing that part out. And then, so so that means I've I've done my job. Instead of asking questions, I'm I'm telling a story. I'm making a a positive statement. And so I felt like those kind of thoughts that I got from Jacobs were. The ones that, to to this day, are the ones that I I try to strive for. That sounds good. I guess Jake would have called that the uh, going for the uh, control panel, rather than for the the gears and the the 
the um, tubes and the the rubber bands and all the, the the mechanisms. Like in a car, you know, you're just hitting the gas or, or the brake pedal rather than trying to understand how all the, the workings under the hood are. You, you can't do that and it's the analysis leads to paralysis syndrome that I was pretty good at but it, it got in the way of my playing and therefore the end product definitely was not what what I wanted. So when you went when you arrived to Chicago you were fairly bound up you were pretty tight. That's a pretty good way to say it. It was it was tight, it was uh, constricted. It was looking for the dark cloud to be under uh, as Mr. Chico had said, "Jeff, you're always looking for that dark cloud." Because I wasn't satisfied and I knew I wanted something better, but I just wasn't able to figure out how to get there. And then and then take that and then a couple of years later after some of the lessons and then trying to practice those items that that were taught to me um, specifically by Jacobs is was that's where I saw the change starting to happen was getting away from trying to analyze and that just led to my paralysis it what helped me was getting away from those thoughts and thinking more about the end product and having um, getting and achieving the sound and the musicality by thinking about what I wanted to sound like rather than listening particularly at the same time it, those two kind of run into each other mm -hmm. and, and I just needed to dominate my thoughts more with the end product thoughts than, right. than how to get there and, and controlling things. Very good. Jeff, well, you're a trumpet player, which is a uh, generally uh, high uh, pressure, low flow uh, instrument, whereas you st we're studying with Mr. Jacobs, who played an instrument that was high flow and low pressure. Um, what was that like? For you, were there were there any commonalities? Anything that uh, how'd that work out? Yeah, I, I think because because of his philosophy of you could say just song and win, the win part of it was was something that I was having trouble with, and and I think with win there's energy and there's flow, but my my usual was more pressure and resistance. So what it helped me. Uh, what it helped me was the fact that when we talked about when it was always more as motion and flow uh, Or you could say when we talked about air it was more about wind which meant mm -hmm. more motion and flow rather than air pressure and so That that helped tremendously because because of, of how I used to do it and the inefficiencies that I had by by studying with mr. Jacobs there was this teaching of of wind as flow and not wind as pressure and so that was critical, even though mine was more of a, of a high pressure, low flow type of instrument, that concept was still there for me and it was very helpful. So even, even on inhalation, um, whether it's a tight sound or an open sound, that, that was a, you know, sort of news to me on how to, how to breathe right and the quantity to breathe in and uh, not holding that air when you're playing and that just leads to tension. So it was critical that I have that teaching and have that understanding so that I could play mm -hmm. in a way that I knew I could, but I, I just I didn't have the mechanisms or I didn't have the order right um, mm -hmm. on how to do that. So it took those kind of lessons to, to learn how to get out of the way and how to breathe properly and be efficient with the with that air to make a sound that I that I was looking for. You know, you mentioned the, the words um, uh, holding the air. Uh, and I remember in a, a prior interview with Greg Irvin, I don't know if Greg, I think he came after you at Northwestern. Greg is the tuba professor, or the brass professor at University of Prince Edward Island up in Canada. He teaches all the brass, and he's a tuba player. And he talked about um, using that concept, holding the air in, that creates tension, that creates pressure rather than just letting it, letting it go. So I'm just curious from a trumpet player standpoint, you know, Jake would have, would have had you you know, he was more or less retraining you to take in larger breaths. But you know, if you if you just at, at first glance you're thinking of trumpet low flow, why would you need to take in uh, much air at all? Why don't you just take in like a third of a, a breath instead of? I'm sure he was having you work fairly, you know, full full bow. Mm. How what was that like? Yeah, I I think it was more. I just remember the little the little verbiage of like you know you're you're pulling up to a gas station and you're just saying fill her up you're you just want to play more with the full tank right. and we talked a little bit about 
you know, filling up, and, and I like the word buoyant, and if you take in too much air, there's that, that uh, constriction that kind of comes into play, and then if you play too long and you get almost empty, there's equally that tension that, that develops. So staying buoyant, even if it's a, if it's a um, short phrase or short note, I think Mr. Jacob says, you know, fill up, it's free. And it just, it, it was a more, that's the way it would normally play, so I don't think I'd want to play abnormally, even if it's a short note or a small phrase, I'd want to play and fill up just as much as I could um, for what was necessary. What, uh, what sort of uh, gadgets or tools um, did he utilize in, in your lessons in terms of breathing? Sure. I, I think it was things definitely to try to, to, to solve these things, not while you're playing, but more away from the trumpet or away from the horn. And one of them was the, um, the bag. I think it was a five or six liter bag that you could just, without getting uh, lightheaded, you could breathe in and out of that bag. And it just gave you that sense and visually a cue as, as to what it really looks like to have a full breath of air. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the, um, the tube with the uh, ping pong ball in it. And that was another uh, thing. You could put a mouthpiece on the end of that too. And I think you could play with that so it, you could try to keep the ball elevated. And then there was the um, the inspirometer, is yeah. that what it was called? Yeah, inspirometer. Yeah. yeah, and uh, that I think you had to flip over to the side and you could adjust mm -hmm. how much air uh, that, could, that it would accept. And there was, those were just examples of tools to solve the problem away from the trumpet. So when you're playing the trumpet or whatever instrument, you're trying to be a musician and not trying to solve all the technical aspects of playing while you're trying to be a musician. You, you, you try to solve those away from the trumpet and then do the same uh, breathing and blowing uh, once you put that trumpet up. Right, so you, you establish um, um, a habit, what he would call a conditioned response or conditioned reflex, mm -hmm. away from the instrument using these tools and then apply that habit with the trumpet in your hands. Right. I think Mr. Chikowitz also said, you know, if your horn is in your lap and you bring it up, there's a lot that happens but from here to here. And so trying to solve problems away from the instrument um, goes a long ways because there's already a lot of built-in issues just from that short distance, uh, whether it's um, tension, shoulders up, whatever. It, it, there's plenty to deal with and try to solve the other things away from the horn seem to make more sense. What, about what period of time were you studying with Mr. Jacobs? Years. Yeah, uh, from which dates? Probably 1983 to about 1988. I left Chicago in October of 88, and um, probably my last lesson was shortly before that. Okay. Yeah. And so you're able to utilize this information in your playing now and also in your teaching. So in my playing, um, we have a small community orchestra here in Bend, and I've been a part of that since 1988. And uh, the conductor is from Luther College, which was Mr. Hertz's uh, college. Yeah. And uh, uh, Michael Gesme is, uh, always challenges us with new pieces, um, harder pieces each year. So there's plenty of, of time to um, practice, but also work on the things that I learn and try to do them at the highest level that I can. And then on a teaching basis, um, bring in those same things that I learned uh, and the needed to learn because I was a player that had a lot of tension issues and things like that. Um, I can bring that to the table and um, and try to nip some of the problems that can develop in young players early on and have a good um, musical solution for technical problems that I think will go yards and yards and yards down the road rather than um, uh, kids trying to solve things in a more quote, traditional way mm -hmm. of trying to analyze what's going on with their body, and I think trying to stay away from that the best I can is what I try to teach. Well, that sounds good. Well, you know, Puddles has really been looking forward to coming to Bend. This is his first time here. I'm, I am glad Puddles make it. Does he always sit in a tree? Well, no, this is just unique to Bend. I've never seen him in a tree before. I think he's happy here. But I think you have dogs. We do have a couple of dogs. And a cat, we, so I I'm kind of wondering if that might have something to do with it. It could get a little more elevation. Yeah. But he was asking me about you, and I said, well, Jeff's from Atlanta. That's right. Originally, and um, you were classmates with uh, Mark Hughes and Bill Zafis, and who all, what other, Bob Dorr? Bob Dorr. Uh, we were, Mark, 
and Bob and myself were all in the Atlanta Youth Symphony, probably 1978 and 79, and I know those guys are on to great careers. Um, uh, Bill Zafis is a, another friend. Mm -hmm. I think he's the world's largest trombone player. Certainly the tallest. Yes. And, um, uh, and then just the, the people that I knew from Northwestern that are playing in different parts of, uh, of the world, really. It's, uh, we were part of a unique time period then, I think, having Mr. Chikowitz as our teacher and then having uh, Mr. Jacobs, especially for me uh, as an instructor, was, was um, as far as my trumpet life goes, was life-changing. And, uh, and even though I'm in a small town, uh, I can still use the same things that I was taught and uh, to better my own playing and, mm -hmm. and teach on to some young players that have students here. Well, um, since, uh, since you're from Atlanta, yeah. Puddle has decided that uh, that great delicacy of, of uh, duck, duck, University of Oregon duck pepper jelly, cream cheese and crackers is really great. So um, Puddles, on behalf of Puddles, I'd like to present you with this uh, thank oh. you gift for taking part in our Tuba People TV program today. Thank you very much. It was great to see you. Great to see you too, Jeff. Back to you.